Thanks for joining us for the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Protocols.io, an open access repository for scientific methods and a tool that allows scientists to create, share, publish, and run detailed step-by-step -step protocols. If you are a scientist and would like to share your method development story on this show, or if you have any friends or colleagues who might be interested to share their stories, we would love to hear from you. You can reach me at anita at protocols.io. That is A-N-I-T-A at protocols.io. I am excited to have Dr. Mansi Srivastava as the guest for today's episode. Mansi received her AB in Biological Sciences from Mount Holyoke College. During her PhD in Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California in Berkeley, she studied comparative genomics of early diverging animal lineages, including nitrogens, glycosoans, and sponges. During her postdoctoral research at Whitehead Institute at MIT, she collected three banded panther worms from a marine pond in Bermuda and developed them as a new model system for studying regeneration. In 2015, she started her faculty position at Harvard University in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, where her research group studies many facets of the biology of panther worms. Mansi, I would like to welcome you to the Minor Tweak Major Impact Podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be on the show. Mansi, we've heard a brief introduction about you already, but can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're currently working on? I consider myself to be an evolutionary developmental biologist, which means that I like to think about questions of how animals have evolved many, many different body plants. And if you look out in the world, there are so many beautiful shapes out there. And developmental biologists study the process of going from a single cell zygote to making a whole adult animal. And evolutionary developmental biologists compare this process across different species to learn how the process of development has changed over evolutionary time to diversify body plans. And so scientists who are evolutionary developmental biologists ask different questions. And the particular one my group focuses on is about the evolution of regeneration, which is this phenomenon where you can take some animals and cut them into two halves or many pieces. And then each of these fragments of the animal can regenerate an entire new organism. And this phenomenon can be seen in many, many different animal phyla. So my group wants to understand whether there are many different ways that animals have come up with to figure out this process of regeneration, or are there some basic shared principles upon which regeneration happens in these many distantly related animals? Cutting up an earthworm in the middle and watching how the two halves continue to live is something many of us might have done as children. And you were involved in identifying a gene that is responsible for regrowth in one special type of worm. Can you please tell us a little bit about that project? So the worm that my lab focuses on is called the three-banded panther worm. So it's not an earthworm. It does not have uh, segments like the typical earthworm you would see on the street when it rains. This worm belongs to a whole different phylum called the aceals. And this is a species that I collected from the field in Bermuda a number of years ago. And once I brought it to the lab, we were able to develop many methods to study the genes that are involved in controlling regeneration in this species. And so a recent study that we published focused on the very early steps of regeneration. We asked what happens right after you cut the worm. And we used many assays that allow us to see how the DNA in the genome of this organism itself changes and how different genes turn on and off as the worm moves down this path of regeneration. And so using these assays, we found this one gene called EGR, which is short for early growth response, uh, which turn on very early in this animal right after we cut it. And we found that this gene is required for this worm to be able to regenerate because it operates as a master regulator that controls many, many different parts of the genome of this animal. And thereby, it controls the turning on of other genes needed for regeneration. 
So the three-banded panther worm, it doesn't really sound like it's available in every backyard or just hanging out there. And you already said you source it from Bermuda, is that correct? That's right. So it is a marine worm. We collected it from a marine pond in Bermuda. Okay, wow. So did you have to fly over there just to get the worm and it traveled back with you to the lab? Or how did that work to source that worm? You're right. So this was something I started during my postdoctoral research when I was at the Whitehead Institute at MIT. And so my postdoctoral advisor and I got on a plane, went to Bermuda, spent a couple of days snorkeling in this beautiful pond and collecting material like algae that these worms live among. And we you know, bring all of that material to the Bermuda Museum of Natural History. As the material sits in buckets, it loses oxygen and the worms start swimming to the top of the water to catch some air. And that's how we collected them. And, you know, there are procedures involved. We had to get permits from Bermuda and from U.S. Fish and Wildlife to bring the worms into Boston following the correct rules and regulations. But yes, so the worms have been in Cambridge, Massachusetts since then, and they're uh, pretty happy. How and why did you decide to start working with that specific worm? That's a good question. And it relates to how I was describing myself as an evolutionary developmental biologist. I like to think about biology or biological processes from an evolutionary perspective. And when I was doing my postdoctoral work, I was in a lab that studies regeneration in a different type of worm called a planarian worm, which have been studied for a long time. And they are a great model system for understanding which genes and which cells are involved in regeneration. But I was not satisfied by thinking about just that one worm. I wanted to know whether anything that we're discovering in those planarian worms applies more broadly across animals to other species that also regenerate. So I decided to collect the three-banded panther worm because, again, we keep using the word worm, so they're wormy, and anatomically we can compare them to planarian worms easily, but it turns out that when you look at the evolutionary history of these two worms, they are very distantly related from each other. The three-banded panther worm is just as closely related to us as it is to the planarian worm. So the last time a planarian worm and humans and the three-banded panther worm shared a common ancestor, that ancestor existed 550 million years ago. So I wanted to study the panther worms and find out genes and cells involved in regeneration so that I could compare them to what we already knew from planarians to understand something about how the process of regeneration has changed over time. That's super interesting. And so that worm does so-called full body regeneration when you cut it in halves or thirds. If you cut it in halves, there will be two fully functioning worms. Is that correct? That's absolutely right, which is why we think this process is such a fascinating type of biology to study. Yeah, that's super cool. You already mentioned in the beginning that we can see that kind of thing happening in different animals as well. Can you name a few other animals that also do things like that? I mentioned the planarian worms and in the same phylum that earthworms belong to. So earthworms are not capable of this awesome regeneration, but there are other segmented worms, many, many, many species that can do that. If you look further out on the evolutionary tree and think about species like sea anemones and jellyfish, they are also phenomenal regenerators, as are representatives of other groups such as the acorn worms, which are more closely related to us, or sea squirts which are the closest invertebrate cousins of vertebrate animals, which are animals that have spines. That discovery of the EGR gene, do you think this could be something that we could also use to trigger regrowing body parts of other animals in the future? That's a good question. So I think that it's a two-part um, answer there. One of the interesting things about our findings is that the EGR gene, it's homologs or similar genes also operate in mammals, such as in mice or in human cells, this gene EGR will turn on upon stress or injury. However, in mammals, it is not accomplishing a whole body regeneration. So we think there's something really interesting to study there. It might be a great way to start asking this question of why in some species, 
we can achieve full body regeneration, but in other species we can't. But I think there is going to be no one easy solution to getting other animals to regenerate. I think, you know, millions of years of evolution have gone by and it's likely that if there was some kind of break in how EGR works, when we think about species that don't regenerate, there are probably many other aspects of the process that also are disconnected. So I don't think we can simply use this gene, but I think it's a really great way to ask this basic biological question of why some animals can regenerate and why some can't. When you're working with any living organisms, it's really important to be extra careful because you wouldn't want to risk the animals dying and then eventually you would have to even go back to Bermuda and collect new worms and it might not be the same exact worm. And so you really want to make sure that the animals you have will be alive and you don't kill them by accident. What are some things you did to lower risks of the animals dying and making sure you'll have the same animals for the entire study? And also, how strict were, for example, their handling or diet protocols, if you had any of these? That's a great question. So we had no protocols whatsoever. Previous to us doing this, nobody had tried to bring these worms and culture them in the lab. So I was doing this completely blind. I had collected the worms and I also measured the salinity or the salt content of the water that they were living in. And that's all I had to start with. So what I did as soon as I brought them back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, is to make artificial seawater in the lab. And I tried to match the salinity of the water that was found in the pond where the worms were living. And after that, it was just a really long process of trial and error. We tried feeding them many different things and eventually found something that they liked to eat. And, you know, at many points, we almost lost the worms. So it, having again to do with the salinity... Even though the salt content of the water that I got from Bermuda was very high, it turned out that the worms were not very happy in that exact water when we kept them in the lab. And it was just by sort of trial and error that I figured out I had to change the salinity from 40 parts per thousand to exactly 37 parts per thousand. And then, and then it started working really well for us. And, you know, I kind of, it was just random trial and error that allowed me to get to that point. I did not have any protocols to begin with, but now we have established protocols that we can provide to other people who might want to start working on this species. Wow, that's crazy that you had to develop the whole protocols yourself. But so you already mentioned the environment of the worms and you almost lost them. And then when you changed a little something that they were happy and they kept living. So that's already like a minor tweak, major impact because your worm survived. But did you ever experience any other minor tweak, major impact moments during your work with those worms? I think that is just a constant feature of being a research scientist, right? That biological systems are complex. And even when we think we figured out a protocol, something changes and you realize that your protocol is not robust. So, you know, because this is a species that is new to research, we've had to develop many new protocols. You know, the first one was, of course, to culture them. But now we've had to develop protocols to study where genes are expressed. First, I did that for just regenerating worms. But now we also do that for the embryos. And all of these different protocols took a lot of time to work out and they still break where there was a joyous moment when one of my grad students came in proudly to show me that he had developed a method to study where certain genes were turned on in the embryos of the species. And he produced these beautiful images. But then the reagents that we were getting from one of the companies that we purchased reagents from changed lot numbers and the protocol stopped working. And then it took a whole year to troubleshoot and reconfigure the protocol such that it began to work again. So this is something that happens to us all the time and potentially more so to us than other labs because we are working on a species that is new to laboratory research. When that lot changed of the reagent vendor, did you know right away that there was something different in the composition of the reagent or how did you figure out it was because of the reagents? Well, first, the, your grad student comes in and is very dejected about their experiment suddenly failing, even though the week before they had shown a beautiful result. And so you start with the fact that the protocol stopped working. And then you start thinking about what changed from one week to the next week. And you figure out that it's the lot number. And often we can't really do anything about the lot number change, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that the reagent doesn't work at all. It means that we have to now readjust the quantities of other things 
uh, or the steps we take in other parts of the protocol to make the whole thing work again. So yeah, usually we've discovered that lot number changes can have a big impact on our experiment in my field. So we are very good about looking at that as a first explanation. I've also heard that sometimes some labs, when something works, they just try to buy a lot of that region of that lot number. So they have <laughs> a lot of in reserve in case they need it. Yeah, that would be a good idea. I think it's just for reagents that the lab is using significant quantities of and we go through a lot of it, it's hard to hoard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then my last question, as always, is do you have any favorite lab tool? And if you do, why is that your favorite tool? We use this concept called RNAi or RNA interference to inhibit gene function in our worms. So this is the kind of experiment that would allow us to ask whether a certain gene is required for a certain process. So this is the type of assay we used, for example, to show that this gene EGR is required for regeneration because when we do RNAi for EGR, that means we've inhibited that gene, the worms fail to regenerate compared to the control RNAi worms. And the fun for me in this experiment is that the way we do the experiment is to inject the worm. We fill up their entire gut with this double-stranded RNA, at the sequence of which matches the gene that you're targeting. And for us, it's a fun experiment because you have this very fine needle loaded on a micro manipulator that you're using to chase the animals around because we don't sedate the animals during this experiment. We find that it works better if you allow the animals to move around. And so it's kind of a fun game you can start playing where the worms are running around under your microscope and you're trying to chase them with this needle and then you poke them and you blow them up like a big balloon. And so I just find that kind of fun. <laughs> <to do. laughs> that sounds super fun. Mansi, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your stories and insights on the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. This is your host, Anita, and we look forward to being with you for our next episode. <laughs>